Hello, I'm Rachel Gordon and welcome to Snapshots Live, our webinar series at San Francisco Public Works, where we talk about our programs and projects, usually with our staff and sometimes with outside partners. This session is going to take about 45 minutes and there will be time for questions and answers. It also will be recorded. Snapshots Live gives us an opportunity to showcase what we do at Public Works. Today, we're going to hear about three initiatives we have uh, to keep our city looking good. We have our private graffiti abatement program where we have inspectors go out and enforce graffiti on private property. Our Clean Quarters SF program, which is a deep cleaning of the city, and also our mechanical sweeping program. So please stay tuned. We're glad you're here with us today. and We're going to get started. I'm going to start off with Kenny Bruce from Street Environmental Services. Kenny. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Uh, Kenny Bruce, Assistant Superintendent for Citywide Street Cleaning Operations. What is Clean Corridors SF? Through a partnership between Public Works and community members, Clean Corridors SF aims to create a more welcoming environment for residents, merchants, and visitors in San Francisco's vital neighborhood commercial districts. We hold our Clean Corridors every Thursday morning between the hours of 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. We rotate through the different supervisorial districts. Some of the assets we use to perform this deep cleaning, uh, I'll go through those now, are various assets to perform what ends up being a very nice clean corridor when we're done. First one is a litter patrol. A litter patrol is a general laborer with a pickup truck that picks up the trash and debris within their assigned areas. A litter patrol picks up the bags and boxes and debris from our clean corridor scrub down and hauls that debris away to the dumps. Uh, next uh, asset we use for this uh, corridor spruce up is we add a half dozen corridor workers to join in on our corridor spruce up operation. They perform detailed cleaning, sweeping, and weeding, uh, and removing debris down to even the cigarette butts. Corridor workers provide that extra attention to detailed cleaning. Next asset we use are our steamers. We use four of them, four steamer units, for each of our corridor cleanups each week. They focus on power washing our city trash cans, the yellow pads that are at the corners, grime and waste. Steam cleaning, sanitize, disinfecting, make a huge difference on these corridors when we're done. We have a mobile sweeper with us uh, during our whole operation to sweep the corridors and the surrounding areas and streets. Next asset we use are our flusher truck. Uh, with the water cannons, flusher truck is to thoroughly flush down the corridors, the streets that we are focusing on, uh, make again, making a huge difference to this spruce up that we're performing. Another big, huge impact are the graffiti abatement crews. Um, they're with us on the scrub down operation, abating tags, removing stickers, and overall painting out blight. The graffiti inspection crew. So this is graffiti inspectors that pay attention to the private properties, residents, and businesses to issue uh, the blight that's on these properties by uh, posting a notice of violations and or a blight notice to these businesses or residences. Next piece of the operation is the education, outreach, and enforcement. Our PIOs and our supervisors go through the corridor. We reach out to the businesses and residents, let them know what is and what is not acceptable. Uh, and again, this can lead to issuing a notice of violation and or a citation. Uh, again, the next one is uh, the details, paying attention to details down to the little weeds uh, in the cracks, down to the little tags that are on the poles and the little bits of spot and grime that may be otherwise not dealt with. 
Uh, again, paying attention to details is what makes such a, a wow factor when we're done. We hear this from people passing by, the residents, the business. They so much appreciate it. We also let them know it is their responsibility to keep the sidewalk clean as well. And uh, on to partnership. This is a, a part that we partner with, again, residents, business, community, uh, CBDs, uh, volunteer groups. It is a partnership to keep the city and county of San Francisco clean. We need everybody to be mindful. And uh, when we are, we have a much more beautiful city. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it on over to uh, Mechanical Sweeping, Sean Lang. Sean, take it away. Thank you, Kenny. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Lang, and I work with the Street, sweep street Sweepers, and I'm here to share with you a little bit of how we operate. To most San Franciscans, mechanical street sweepers may represent little more than the inconvenience of having to move their car on street cleaning days or the unwelcome $83 fine stuck under the windshield wiper. But what exactly are people getting in return for this inconvenience? A lot. Despite the monumental effort and the wide variety of benefits it provides, street sweeping remains one of the most misunderstood and overlooked aspects of our work in the 19th of our work. In the 1980s, a street sweeping program was developed and initiated for the general public of San Francisco. And the purpose of this motorized street sweeping program is beneficial in providing safety to the public and reducing pollution to the environment. It was developed by San Francisco Department of Public Works and is currently operated by the Bureau of Street Environmental Services. At this time, BSES utilizes a fleet of 65 trucks with 45 of those being specialized street sweepers. We have about 50 to 60 drivers that perform the street sweeping program. Basically, there are about 18 weekly day routes and nine weekly night routes, and there are smaller ancillary routes and other duties to fulfill as well to ensure the street sweeping program functions efficiently. BSES has a sweeper available and on duty 24 hours a day. So our fleet consists mostly of specialized sweepers. Here in this picture on the upper left is the backbone of our fleet, which is the Timco 600. It can be mounted on either an international, that's your older trucks, and uh, this, this one's a Peterbilt, one of our newer ones. Um, that one right there, 207, is uh, the Tenderloin Broom. If it could only tell stories, it, it, it does, does a heck of a job. Uh, it's a regenerative air sweeper, meaning it recirculates air. And it uses gutter brooms to move debris from the curb into the path of the sweeper head. And the regenerative air process blows air into one end of the sweeper head that's on the ground, and it blows it onto the pavement, the wind, dislodging materials. And at the other end of the sweeper head is a suction hose that vacuums up the materials and deposits it into the hopper. The air is then recirculated back through the system to the sweeper head. And It's a distinctly different operation from a pure vacuum system. It recirculates air and anything that gets caught in there is whisked away into the hopper. You can see it's got a secondary motor up on the middle and that's what runs the sweeper. It's a remarkable machine because it's got less moving parts than other sweepers and it can pick up light debris pretty quickly. In fact, all the routes that we have today were designed around the capabilities of the Timco 600 serving areas on a weekly basis. The other sweeper in the upper right is one of our new Johnston bicycle brooms that we recently acquired to maintain about 20 miles of bike lanes. At this point, we've got three of them and the bicycle lane sweeping program is still in its infancy, infancy and growing. Um, these machines do work, but it's a tough job and they're getting worked hard. Right below that on the lower right is a mechanical broom. This broom consists of a big barrel brush in the back and it flips debris forward onto an elevator, which is, it's, it's more of a big flat plate and it has squeegees going up and it flips up into the hopper. Um, this is good for picking up sand and gravel and heavy material, as opposed to the regenerative air sweeper, which uses air and suction. So on the left is our newest addition. And this is one of the best sweepers I've ever seen. It works strictly on vacuum. It can pick up fine dust and particulates, and it has a built-in pressure washer system to assist in cleaning the dirtiest streets. This is our best sweeper for cleaner water and air. And now to the next page. 
this is some of our fleet. We got four packers in the upper left. That's basically a garbage truck. And those are important because they can carry more than pickup trucks. I mean, five mattresses will fill up a pickup truck, but we could throw a bunch in the packer and it packs it tightly and it's more efficient and the way to go. And then on the upper right is a self-loading dump truck. We have two of these. And if a broom fills up and they do, we send this truck to get their load. On the lower right is an end dump, and it's just a big dump truck, and we use that to move all the material that we generate on a daily basis. Then on the lower left is a unique machine called the tunnel washer. That's you, we use that to clean the Broadway tunnel and the Gary tunnel. <clears throat> so on the next slide, we can talk about our schedule. Got a lot of day routes that start at either 5.30 or 6.30 in the morning for the driver, and they get out to the start of their sweep zone, and they sweep at like 6 or 7, they start. And the day routes would consist of like the Richmond, Pacific Heights, Excelsior, Portola, Sunset, Inner Sunset, Parkside, Mission, uh, the Bayview, Bernal, Marina, Glen Park. And our night routes uh, that they started at like 11 at night and go to nine in the morning. That's a financial district and the Tenderloin and Chinatown, the industrial section. Um, we got a night mission run and we got the South Market. So on the days, the first sweep is called the business route. The business route consists of most of the main thoroughfares and streets with businesses. After the business run around eight o'clock, the brooms sweep in residential areas for the rest of the day. So all these routes used to be weekly, meaning Monday through Friday. Um, it was all the same, Monday through Friday. And back in around 2007, 2008, there was an idea to reduce the frequency of street sweeping on 10 routes. And what they did is rather than 10 drivers and 10 sweepers, they utilized five drivers and five sweepers to take care of 10 routes. And the way they did this is, or like, like I'm gonna use route one and route two as an example. Route one is swept on the second and fourth day of the month. And route two is swept on the first and third day of the month. So this way, one driver and one broom takes care of two routes. During the fall in heavy conditions, we have a lot of brooms filling up by lunch and they need to go dump and we need to assist them. So you need to consult the calendar with this first and third and second and fourth system to be sure of the day because some months will start on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And those would be the first Wednesday and Thursday. Also, I'd like to mention that in San Francisco, once the broom sweeps by with its brooms down, you may park behind it. But I hear not so in Daly City. All right, let's talk about weight. I like this part because this is, Weight doesn't lie. Last year in 2020, BSCS got over 35 million pounds. 33 million pounds of that was done by our heavy trucks and sweepers. Our packers got four and a half million. We had a homeless removal program that netted 5.9 million pounds. And our sweepers got 22 and a half million pounds of debris off the streets. The combined total mileage that all our sweepers did last year of the mileage of all the streets we swept, sweeping miles, was 163,000 miles. So I was looking at 25,000 miles around the earth. So that's like going around the earth six and a half times. And also I see here, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge weighs 29 million and the Eiffel Tower 22 million. It's pretty amazing. And this is all, I remind you, San Francisco is just seven by seven miles. And we, we get all that. So going on to the next one, COVID. Many people have asked how COVID affected the street sweeping program. COVID did impact street sweeping. Back in March 17th, 2020, a shelter in place directive was initiated. So everybody stayed home and there were so many cars in the way, especially after they suspended issuing citations. We were on duty, but inefficient due to the amount of miles blocked on our lanes to sweep because of parked cars. There were 60, 70, 80, and even 95,000 cars back in May, equating to an estimated 450 miles of blocked roadway that we intended to sweep in a week. It's Monday through Friday. Then in mid-June, City Hall notified the public that the citation reinstatement would happen and the cars started moving and our weights increased. And here in this chart showing COVID's impact in 2020, you can see how it dips. A normal year would show a sweep in around 500,000 pounds a week. And that would be at the top of the line all the way across. So you can see it really did impact us. So going on to the next slide, which would be the uh, benefits of mechanical street sweeping. Let's start with improving air quality. Air quality can be impacted from fine particles stirred up on the roadway surface. Street sweeping with higher efficiency sweepers like vacuum or regenerative air sweepers can improve air quality. 
By removing these fine particulates, another benefit is reducing roadway debris and increasing roadway safety. Street sweeping for appearance and trash removal purposes and infrastructure efficiency is an important reflection upon a community's environment and good public works practice to maintain proper infrastructure operating efficiency. Public works operations implement street sweeping to remove accumulated leaves and debris from the gutter line. The removal of such materials is critical in preserving hydraulic efficiency of stormwater infrastructure. If catch basins become clogged with leaves and debris, the risk of roadway flooding increases, thereby presenting a hazard to the traveling public. Street sweeping is conducted to reduce safety hazards to the traveling public, meaning vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. And sustaining water quality, maintaining or improving water quality enhances the quality of our environment and demonstrates compliance with local and state regulatory requirements to reduce pollutant loading to receiving waters. Street sweeping is an accepted best maintenance practice for reducing pollutant loading into receiving waters. When street sweeping is combined with other treatment, best maintenance, practice quality, best maintenance practices, water quality can be improved. Street sweeping is the first and most cost-effective measure to affecting water, water quality. Basically, the sweeper can pick up a pound of debris for dollars before it goes down the pipe into the water treatment system. And by the time it comes out of the pipe, a pound of it comes out of the pipe, it could cost hundreds of dollars. So it's a good thing. So on the next uh, slide, I mean, at the end there, incentivize moving cars. The best way to make vehicle removal as painless as possible is to get buy-in from the local community. We want the citizens to know why we want them to move their vehicles so the sweeper can be more efficient and do its job. Um, and, you know, that's what this webinar is doing. It's helping us, you know, educate the, the public about what we do and, and what we need them to do, move their cars. After all, it's for their safety, health, and security. So thank you for this opportunity to explain what we do. And with that, I would like to introduce Alicia, who will educate us about the graffiti program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alicia, and I work with the Private Graffiti Abatement Program. This program enforces graffiti abatement on private property throughout San Francisco. There are graffiti inspectors throughout every district that respond to 311 calls regarding graffiti on private property. The inspectors have three days to respond to a 311 complaint. A 30 day notice of violation is posted on the property if the graffiti is fairly small to medium size. This allows the property owner to have 30 days to remove the graffiti. If the graffiti is large, the inspector will post the blight notice on the property, which allows the property owner 15 days to remove the graffiti. If the graffiti isn't removed within the allowed time, a contractor will be called in to abate the graffiti from the property. If this happens, the property owner will be responsible for a $320 blight fee and the cost of the contractor's fee. We do our best to give a courtesy call or email on the same day to property owners that have received a 30 day notice of violation or a blight notice. We also mail the notice of violations to the property owner's address, just in case the physical posting was ripped off the property. Our goal is not to punish the property owners of San Francisco, but to provide them with the resources and prevention techniques. We offer hardship hearings to property owners that feel they are receiving a disproportionate amount of graffiti. The property owner must send in a hardship letter to the director's office and give a brief explanation of the hardship they are having. After the hardship letter is received, a date is scheduled. Public works and the property owners meet at city hall for the hearing. If the property owner is granted hardship, the city will remove the graffiti from their property for six months. I remember being a part of a hardship hearing for a property owner that mentioned to me she had cancer once we arrived. We wanted to, she wanted to prove her case on why she needed hardship. At that point, I spoke to the hearing officer and was able to get her hardship granted. We are here to help the property owners of San Francisco and I know this particular property owner was battling something way more severe than graffiti. Our administrative office provides FAQ sheets of resources and prevention techniques. 
One resource is free paint that is offered at Recology, 501 Tunnel Road Avenue, Thursday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Street Smarts Program is another resource. This is a partnership between San Francisco Public Works and the San Francisco Arts Commission. Artists are paired up with private property owners that have received a notice of violation or blight notice on their building. The artist works with the property owner by helping them understand what kind of mural would be best for their neighborhood. Prevention techniques, deterrence. Deterrence include having plants and trees in front of the property wall. Motion sensor lighting and video surveillance are also great deterrents for vandals. During the COVID lockdowns, the graffiti department provided courtesy abatements every Tuesday and Thursday for properties in various districts that were tagged extensively. Let's all work together and keep San Francisco safe and clean. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ben Peterson, who will be facilitating the Q&A. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you to the rest of our panelists as well for uh, giving us the rundown on all these different uh, programs that Public Works runs in order to uh, love our city. Um, the uh, first question that I um, received uh, is actually for, um, is for Sean, or I guess it would be best um, answered by Sean. And this is um, one that was, we received through the chat. And um, this person is asking, um, of all the over 20 routes that we have, are there any that are, um, you know, we end up collecting the most uh, residue or debris from? Or there, are there any that are more um, dirty than others, would you say? Uh, the, the mission's pretty heavy and uh, the Bayview. Um, the mission was so heavy and it's a lot of its leaves, but uh, mm -hmm. we actually, a couple of years back, uh, increased, a, a, we had an afternoon route, Bernal Heights, but we took a lot of the mission and we overlapped with two brooms so we could slow down and do a better job. Because back in the day, the mission broom was dumping three times a day and he had to go fast to complete the whole route. So we slowed him down so he can prove his level of the service and it's been working out better. Great, good to hear. Um, uh, the next question is probably best uh, for Kenny. Um, you mentioned how the Clean Corridors SF program is uh, provides a really deep clean to the different corridors that we target. Um, how does this process different from our other uh, normal cleaning operations? You know, are there additional aspects to it that um, make it that deep clean as opposed to the rest of the, the work that we do? Okay, so uh, on a normal request, service request, the litter patrol is responding to a specific area um, that describes, you know, whether it's illegal dumping, uh, bags, trash, whatever it may be. The same thing for the steamers. They're, they are responding to service requests received to address uh, whether it's uh, dog waste or other waste uh, at a specific location. Um, so the big difference between that is this focused corridor uh, spruce up is an intense deep cleaning uh, from end to end, whereas the litter patrols and steamers are responding to specific service requests okay so it's a more comprehensive approach as well so we're getting we're getting a lot of people involved um kind of to follow up on that how many people would you say um from all different you know aspects of the clean corridor uh session how many people do you think in total are involved from the uh, litter patrol to the people driving the tr uh, sweeper trucks and flushers uh do you have a like a ballpark answer for how many people usually are involved yeah i would say probably uh, around 20 people Okay, you know, wow. you're taking into consideration the supervisors, the laborers, the steamers, the graffiti crew, mm -hmm. the truck drivers who drive the flusher and sweeper. Uh, I would say around and the six corridor workers, uh, easily at least uh, 20 people and the graffiti inspectors, if not more. Okay, thanks. That is yep. definitely uh, quite the crew. <laughs> Let's see. Um, our next question is for Alicia. Um, in, the, in your descri description of the Street Smarts program, you talked briefly about finding or figuring out like the right mural for the neighborhood. Um, could you expand on like what that means and you know what, um, what factors are kind of considered when you're uh, deciding what, you know, which artists to 
include or what type of mural to include in a specific neighborhood? So um, typically, um, depending on the neighborhood, um, there's a lot of murals just say of like actual, you know, artwork, things that are really colorful, depending on if the mural is going to go on, just say a roll up door versus an actual, you know, wall for the building. Um, it also just um, depends on the, the kind of neighborhood and, and what's accepted by the community. Okay. Um, so those are um, major things that are always looked at um, by the artists when they communicate that to the property owner. So they have um, their own way of trying to kind of explain to them what would be best um, and what the community would um, just say accept or they feel that would be more accepting in that area. Great. Thanks. So it's kind of incorporates both community feedback and getting them involved, but also just the um, you know, the building itself and what that kind of allows for. Correct. Cool. Thanks. Um, the next question, um, probably for Sean again, um, how is the weight calculated of all the debris and trash picked up by um, street sweepers? Are there like sensors on the trucks or how is that counted? When we go and bring the waste to Recology, the trucks are weighed on scales. And so ah, okay. we get a tag and we know exactly how much we got. Okay. Sounds simple enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, our next question, um, this one will be for Kenny as well. Um, are there um, any major differences between the uh, different corridors that you clean up um, through this program? I know they're all commercial corridors, so they have you know that in common, but um, is the process of cleaning up in say the Richmond district different than the Marina district, different than the mission or uh, what have you? Yeah, good question. And today's cleanup was a prime example. Uh, I was speaking with the director and I said, this isn't Chestnut Street. Today mm -hmm. we were on 24th Street. Mm -hmm. So the difference between that is there are so many more tags, stickers, uh, overall grime. It's much more uh, densely populated, highly condensed area. Uh, so today we did 24th Street from Valencia to Folsom. Uh, and the reason why I say it isn't Chestnut Street is Chestnut was pretty clean when we arrived. So that that's the difference. I mean, just way more steaming, uh, way more uh, graffiti abatement uh, is, is the huge difference. So much more, we still got it clean, but it took way more time and way more effort to get the same number of blocks clean uh, versus somewhere on the other side of the city like, uh, like Chestnut Street in the marina. All right, thanks. Um, this next one is uh, is for Alicia again. Um, you mentioned how COVID or, or graffiti got really, really prevalent during the beginning of COVID when you know things were more locked down, um, and we were um, you know providing extra assistance to private property owners to help get that um, abated. Have have we noticed it uh, calming down at all as you know as the months have progressed? Are we still seeing heightened levels of of graffiti, or has it kind of gotten back to more pre-COVID levels? Would you say? So I can say um, our staff um, has really been on top of it, um, but we have noticed that there is still tons of graffiti out there. Um, you know, the schools are still um, out. A lot of, you know, the kids are work, going to school from home and, you know, things like that. Um, but it's not necessarily uh, the kids that are doing this graffiti. Um, we get reports from Officer Ferreira with the San Francisco Police Department. He's over the graffiti abatement department and the gang task force. So he provides information to us that most of the people that actually get caught for doing the tags are at least 25 years old and up. So um, we have noticed that there is still a lot of graffiti out there and um, we have inspectors in every district uh, making sure that we are present and we are posting the notices of violation so property owners can take care of their property. All right, thank you. It seems like it's a pretty constant, um, very involved process. Um, the next question is for Sean and it's about um, street sweeping at different times of the year. You mentioned that the fall is particularly um, difficult and there's a lot of things to, uh, things to consider with that. Um, 
do you, um, as the seasons change and, you know, the different types of different types of debris um, become more prevalent, do you use different types of sweepers more often uh, than others at, at these different times of year, depending on, you know, what their specific, um, you know, characteristics are and what they're better at picking up? A little bit, not so much. Uh, the, the Timcos do a good job and they're basically on the route, you know, so route one, route two, they get the same broom all the time, but we do assist it. When the loads get extremely heavy, you can't pick them up as well. And, and in fact, uh, the panhandle is a great example of that. Uh, a lot of eucalyptus, and it's so heavy that the air brooms sort of clog up. And so we'll run a okay. mechanical broom in front of them to take some of the load. And in fact, we've been, uh, it's been so, it's been very heavy this year, um, in spite of our weight being a little low. But like we had a wind event a month ago. You know, it heats up, then it rains, and the wind, and and it all drops at once. And it, it's 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 difficult to produce a high level of service with conditions like that. But th we'll get it the next week, you know. And and it, it it we just keep on vacuuming away, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, this next one, uh, I guess, would be for Kenny. Um, just generally, you mentioned, um, you know, kind of the the educational aspect of clean corridors SF, but um, if you could just give a quick rundown or a pitch to the average, you know, business owner or uh, resident of San Francisco, what they can do to help, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, make their uh, neighborhood or their block a little bit cleaner or, or help out with our, um, help out with our efforts. Sure. So another uh, example was this morning, we had a stack of cardboard boxes on 24th uh, and there was ID on the boxes business was closed. So the supervisor in the area is going to follow up with that business. Mm -hmm. But that is, uh, it's improper put out to leave the boxes out at the curb. They're supposed to be containerized in the blue recycling bin. Yeah. Um, they may explain, well, uh, uh, my friend was going to pick them up or they call it the mosquito fleet, but it's improper for them to leave the boxes out like that. So many times we'll find businesses that will do that, storm out overnight, in the hopes that they will be picked up. But the other times people will just knock it over, throw them in the street uh, and what have you. So I'm sure the business owner did not intend to blight their own area, but the cardboard boxes uh, can be used for a variety of things. Mm -hmm. So we have to educate, we'll uh, create a history with the resident or business uh, we'll talk to them. We'll educate them of their responsibilities. But if it continues, that's when we'll move on to actual paperwork, uh, notice of violation, and or escalating to a, a monetary citation. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. This next one is um, a question from uh, Sam Dodge, who's one of the attendees. And he is uh, asking Alicia, do we also include the uh, various community benefits districts or business improvements districts um, if graffiti happens in their zone or do we, um, you know, give them a notice as well? Um, is that within their jurisdiction at all or do they get involved with um, graffiti abatement as well? So a lot of the times um, when the inspectors post um, notice of violations in certain areas, um, the CBD may contact us and they may ask for us to reach out to them um, because they have, you know, their own people that will go ahead and abate in that area. So um, we either get I want to say property owners that contact us and say, hey, you know, we pay for this service. You need to contact, you know, the CBD or you need to contact, you know, different people because they pay a certain fee mm -hmm. um, for them to come out and abate. So my team will just post a notice of violation. And if the CBD contacts us and lets us know that they have someone in that area, then we like to work with them as well. Um, so we don't kind of overlap. But once a 311 request comes in, the inspectors have three days to go out to the property and address that property. So that's something that we do here. So if posting is needed, we will post within three days. All right, thank you. Um, and we have one last question and this one is for, um, for Sean. Um, you spent a bit of your por portion of the presentation talking about the different types of sweepers that we have um, and their various uses and things that they're best um, able to pick up. Um, in general, how would, 
would you say, how much more effective and efficient would you say that these, this newer generation of sweepers is than the ones that we had previously or back, you know, when street sweeping uh, kind of started up in the city? Have you seen like some pretty big jumps in uh, the technology and the, um, you know, effectiveness of these sweepers um, or is the technology kind of stayed more or less the same over the years? Well, basically, there's just types of uh, the regenerative air sweeper. There's a couple of different manufacturers, so they're a little bit different. Uh, there's different manufacturers for the mechanical brooms and also the vacuum brooms. Um, picking the right sweeper for the job is an important aspect. Uh, the regenerative air sweepers do a good job. We're actually it's pretty neat that San Francisco invested in getting a vacuum sweeper. It's the new technology and we're going to test it on routes, but right now we're happy to have one to put in the tenderloin and follow that, that 207 Timco regenerative sweeper that we saw earlier. Now we can mm -hmm. send this broom behind it or in front of it, but it, it can take its time and really do a deep cleaning that the, the Timco can't do. The Timco is just picking stuff up off the ground. That uh, vacuum broom also has pressure washers built in, so it can pressure oh, wow. wash the street and vacuum at the same time. And uh, I'm not sure how it'll do on a, a long route. Um, the mechanical brooms, they're slower. They don't really do a route very well, but they pick up sand great. So mm -hmm. it's really what's what the job is to pick the right broom for the right job and have it properly maintained. So to, and, and then the driver's trained and then it does a great job. Great. So it seems like all the different um, types of sweepers that we have really do each play their own role in um, helping get the streets as clean as possible. Yeah, we got the bicycle lane sweepers that are for the narrow areas and, and necessary, about 20 miles of bike lanes. We also have some Ravos, uh, which are a, a sweeper from the Netherlands, and they were used recently for cleaning the alleys. They'd have two uh, hand wand pressure washers built off the top, and so we'd have two laborers going down the sidewalks and blowing out all the debris into the path of the sweeper. And it's pretty effective. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. And that's a vacuum sweeper, by the way. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that's uh, about all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you all again for providing us with all that information. Um, I'm gonna hand it back over to Rachel Gordon to give us our uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Kenny, Sean, and Alicia. Uh, these are just three of the programs we have with the Street Environmental Services Bureau, Street Cleaning Bureau. There are more than a dozen special operations. If you just think about it, the team co collects almost a million pounds of garbage a week in San Francisco. These are three very effective programs. Uh, we hope to keep them going strong. We are committed to keeping San Francisco clean. There are also a few things that you can do if you live in San Francisco or have a business, grab a broom and a dustpan or a picker. We'll even give you supplies or a paint and a paintbrush to get out graffiti. It's gonna take all of us to make sure that San Francisco is kept clean. Uh, but this is gonna wrap it up for this episode of Snapshots Live. We will be back next month to talk about our COVID response in San Francisco. Crazy to think about it, but it's been a year uh, since we started the shutdown in San Francisco and Public Works has been at the forefront of helping to keep San Francisco uh, functional and safe during the public health crisis. But I wanna thank again, all the participants for the show and really thank people for tuning in to Snapshots Live. We'll see you again next month.